This is Season 1, Episode 2, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation Magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we've created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of short stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you would go over and check it out. In fact, we discuss the ethics and decisions made in this very story in our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, in episode 48. So when you're all done listening to this audio podcast, head over to our companion podcast and listen to our discussion of this story. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comments section, or on our Facebook page. I'm Colby, your narrator, and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com backslash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoyed this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story is by Mark Braidwood, and it was in our April 2021 magazine. The story is called Reach. Jack Benson stands dissolved in an ocean of strangers, humans he couldn't have known existed until forced to jostle with them for space and share odors. He recoils imperceptibly, with each touch, eager not to offend or stand out any further. As a mass, they flow like a tide, but he senses that, as individuals, each is preoccupied with being elsewhere. He marvels at this accretion of humanity, at how in each moment, somewhere on earth, such a mass of people goes about their day. Who are they? What do they want, feel, do with their lives? The man next to him smells of cigarettes and holds a child's doll. He looks nervous. Perhaps it's been a while since he saw her. He wonders if there is a set of personality archetypes such that it's possible to know every type of person that has ever existed, if only you could map them onto the right template. This thought had struck him while on the plane. He had sat next to someone, round-backed, in his forties and dressed in brown chinos and a blue turtleneck, no doubt middle management in some tech company, whom he felt he had met so many times before, the way he introduced himself unprompted, assured of the pleasure of his own company. Finally, the custom desk looms above him, the throng's singular objective. He hands over his passport. Mr. Benson, what is the point of your visit? The immigration officer asks. Business. The officer stares at him and again at his passport. Was his suspicion an act or learned from experience? How long? His cheeks redden and his heart quickens. What he's doing isn't illegal, not where he's from. A few days. The officer returns his passport and waves him through, his mask degrading briefly into indifference, boredom, or perhaps fatigue. His employer had arranged for someone to meet him. It hadn't been difficult to justify this detour from his itinerary, the department head thinking it positive for their corporate image. They briefed him not to trust anyone, that there was every chance the people he met with would work for the party, whatever that meant. A row of men in ill-fitting suits surrounded the exit, holding signs with names hastily scrawled across paper, some in English, others Chinese. He finds his name printed on a white placard, held by a muscular man with dark hair and tan skin, standing a little apart from the others. Mr. Benson, 
Welcome to Guangdong. My name is Wei. May I take your bag? His English is excellent. Not the kind picked up begrudgingly in school or from watching reruns of American soaps, but the kind cultivated with prolonged effort. Did that mean he was good at his job or had another job entirely? Jack thanks him. The man seems surprised at how light his bag is, perhaps used to 50-pound monsters. But the only important thing, the reason he's here, is folded in his top pocket. The car is parked at the pickup area. He sits in the back. Which hotel, sir? I'd like to go straight to this address, please. He holds out his phone and the driver squints as he reads. His eyebrows rise slightly, perhaps at the unexpected address or the distance. I can pay. Thank you, but that won't be necessary. The man had a large flask from which he sipped constantly, the smell hinting at some kind of tea. It was supposed to be easy finding this place. Just ask Charlie Pringle, someone had suggested. Unlike his own workspace, which had a weeping fig in the corner and a print of Klimp's beach forest on the wall, Charlie had arranged his favorite toys around his office. He had tried hard not to judge him. How can I help? Charlie asked with bright eyes. Where do we manufacture the K-Bot? Need to chase something up. Charlie frowned, swiveling in his chair and tapped away at his computer. After a while, he turned back. As I thought? Don't know. I don't understand, Jack said. Same with most of our lives. We outsource it to someone on the ground. I see. Can you ask them? Charlie shook his head. They won't know either. Jesus, don't we know where we make our own toys? Charlie's eyes narrowed. I'm going to China to meet with our suppliers, Jack explained. Thought I might tour some factories while there. It took Charlie two weeks to locate it. As they leave the airport, the city reads like a coming-of-age story in reverse. The downtown buildings, rendered in sleek lines and gleaming surfaces, rows standing tall with the aggressive symmetry of collector's cabinets, contents stuffed, segregated, and cataloged. Did it ever happen that somebody confused their home for another's, mistakenly entering a copy of their apartment? He smiles. Could someone accidentally adopt a new life, a new family? Glimpses of great gouges in the earth rush past the window, waiting to be healed by concrete and steel. Further along, older dwellings cling to the banks of a muddy river, a mosaic of color and shape, a jumble of crossed paths and perhaps shared fates. Occasionally, he glimpses empty fields in the distance. It was odd how long it had taken him to think of translating the note. He'd guessed that it was Chinese and had taken it to Joanne in HR who grew up there. She looked at the photograph he had taken of the small piece of paper torn from a notebook. The original was too precious and might raise questions. She squinted, her lips moving silently before she spoke. Okay, this is a short poem. What does it say? She read aloud. Thunder rolls. Leaves hang heavy. I bow my head. It wasn't what he'd expected, and now even more out of place. Is that it? Yep, told you it was short. It's nice. Who wrote it? I... I don't know, he said. My niece found it for a school project. Just curious is all. It is curious. In what way? Well, its form is reminiscent of Japanese haiku, but it's written in Mandarin. He had imagined a plea for help or bearing witness to some crime instead of a poem. He kept her hastily scrawled English translation and regularly returned to it, perhaps hoping the freshness of another read might reveal a clue. Each time he read it, he was reminded of when his parents took him for walks in the forest, the one that is now a shopping mall, and the smell of rain soaking into the ground, of a wet leaf brushing against his cheek. He had started reading haiku in Chinese poetry, but the secret note remained his favorite. After almost an hour, they reached the area of the city where the factories sprawl, the cogs and gears of wealth buttressing the entire edifice, alchemists turning lead into gold. He began to taste the soot that clings to everything. We're here, the driver says. I'll take you in. 
They park outside a dirty gray multi-story office building, dwarfed by the large attached annex. Inside the office, he is met by a man and a woman. The site manager, in his 40s, with a middle bulge to match his status, and the daughter of the company's founder, a stout woman with graying hair. To Jack's relief, she speaks English. His driver does not introduce himself. As they show him around, the woman talks about how the company started making Christmas tree decorations. They walk deeper into the factory. He begins to doubt himself. If word got back to the office about what he was trying to do here, what would they think? Worse, could he be mistaken for a human rights activist? Workers' conditions are a touchy subject. Was it too late to turn back? His family knows he's here, but not why. Such a strange thing to find, he'd chosen to keep it to himself. It had been the Christmas just gone. He had finished adding the brandy to the eggnog and had sat down to watch the kids prowl around the base of the tree. Even though it almost touched the ceiling, the stack of presents around its base somehow made the tree look small. An embarrassa de riches, his wife might say if she were to notice. He and his wife had bought this house just after they married. Since then, they'd had two kids and watched the neighborhood change as older residents died and their children moved away, as the houses gained a level or were replaced altogether. The kids want to start, honey, he called. Go ahead, I'll be a little while. Which of these toys would become inseparable from his children such that he would need to know their whereabouts at all times, and which would end up in the basement after a few days, stored until they could be donated, given away, or, was typical, discarded? Richmond, the eldest, had already opened one of his presents, holding up the colorful plastic robot like a trophy kill. What does it do? It talks and follows commands. Your friends will think it's great. Richmond quickly found the on button and pressed it. Nothing happened. It doesn't work. Keep trying, sweetheart. It comes with batteries. When it didn't do anything, his interest flagged and he dropped the toy. At his feet, moved on, tearing into the paper wrapping of the next present in his pile. Jack got out of his chair and picked up the robot. It definitely wasn't working. Larry from marketing had said it would be a sure thing. He unscrewed the back. The batteries were not sitting properly. Wedged underneath was a piece of paper. He unfolded it. As they make their way through the factory, he controls his anxiety by asking questions, feigning interest in every detail. Finally, they reach the control room. He meets the foreman and draws out a conversation about forecasting, scheduling, and capacity planning as much as he's able. It seems he can't bore either of them. May I watch the factory for a while? She smiles, eager to please. He turns his back on her and pretends to be engrossed in the view from the window that overlooks the factory floor. Hundreds of workers sit in a large room lit by strips of fluorescent tubes suspended from the ceiling, their hands in constant motion as they assemble the final product from parts manufactured elsewhere. He has gambled that this would be the best stage in manufacturing to hide a note. It would be too risky any earlier. Some of the toy parts on the assembly line are familiar, so he at least has the correct factory. But what are the chances the poem's author is here? His stomach tightens and mouth is suddenly dry. What a fool he has been to think that he could find the person. And what did he hope to achieve if he did? Continuing to watch is all he can think to do. After it's clear he intends to watch for a while, they excuse themselves probably wondering about this strange foreigner, and leave him with his driver and the foreman. His driver's gaze roams around the room. Surely he would need the bathroom eventually. He had drunk almost a liter of tea during the drive. After ten minutes of silence from the corner of his view, a flicker of irritation of involuntary movement toward the door. Here it is. The driver takes one last look around the room, then excuses himself. Jack crosses over to the foreman. Do you speak English? He shrugs. Jack pulls out an envelope, fat with yuan, calculated to be the equivalent of a month's wage. The man's eyes open wide. He hands him the poem, moves back to the windows, points and says, Read. The foreman's face is hard to judge, but he walks over to a microphone, checking the door behind. 
The words of the poem boom across the factory floor. The speakers easily overcome the noise of the machinery. The effect is immediate. A woman erupts from anonymity, standing bolt upright. About his age, thin and tired, eyes wide and flicking about. Jack bangs on the glass. Their eyes meet. The tiny muscles in her face compose stanzas that flow from recognition to surprise, then wonder to fear, a message sent and received. Perhaps a friendship never realized. He longs to reach out to her as she did to him, to tell her how he often reads her message. Jack smiles, but the moment is lost. She sits down and bows her head, reclaimed by her chore. What did she see? A stranger who crossed an ocean to find the hand that penned a note hidden inside a child's toy? Her strong hands resume their motion between the conveyor belt and her workstation. Where else have her poems traveled? He wonders suddenly if it might belong to a secret club, its members touched by this woman's yearning. Other workers are looking at her. A man on the factory floor is pointing up at him. Jack has put her in danger, has maybe exposed whatever it is she's doing. Footsteps approach. Would she be okay? Had he missed some kind of subtext in her poem, which was actually a cry for help? He meets the owner in the hall. It must have been her footsteps he heard. She looks behind him as she asks if everything is all right and if he would like to join her in the office for a cup of tea. He makes an excuse of not feeling well and thanks her for the tour, just as a buzzer announces the end of shift. By the time he is outside, Wei, his driver, is running to catch up. It's now late in the afternoon. Long shadows dance at the feet of the workers who make their way home. He pushes through the throng toward the parked car. Somebody grabs his arm. Tingles of fear crackle through him, but it's just a young girl with clear brown eyes and black hair pulled into a ponytail. Her daughter, perhaps. She places something in his hand and then merges with the crowd. Without looking at it, he can tell it's a book. He instinctively stashes it in his coat pocket, taking the place of the poem that he realizes now, in his haste to depart, he is left with the foreman. The message has returned home. He curses softly. They get in the car, and as they leave, he laughs out loud. Wei looks at him in his rearview mirror, forcing him to turn his head and conceal his smile. The book is heavy in his pocket, but is too special to risk looking at now. The trip back to the airport is uneventful, but it is only after his plane takes off that he relaxes. He had watched the face of every passenger who boarded, half expecting they were coming to take his book from him. The man sitting next to him smells of an aftershave he used to wear when courting his wife. Back then it was cheap, but now is expensive and he won't spend the money. The man is young and well-dressed, probably only recently graduated to business class. Single, working long hours and assured of his future success in life, unaware yet of how stealthily frustration and disappointment creep up behind, how easy it is to fool oneself about what matters and how best to spend time. He waits a while before reaching into his pocket for the book. It's small, with a black cover and red spine. He recognizes the paper and her delicate handwriting. Some of the pages have been torn out. Did his poem come from this book? He wonders if he should show it to his children, tell them what little he knows about the people who make their toys, or is it their right to at least have a childhood free of paradox? After flipping through the book, he is already planning how to get it translated, eager to read what else she has to say. He smiles as he puts it away. It's already the most precious book he owns. The End Discussion Questions Number 1. What do you think the poem means? How much can we tell about the author from it? Number 2. Would you want to know the worker situation of the various toys, fruits, or other customer products that you use? Number three, is it fair to be burdened with knowing, or force other people to know, about the mirrored effects of their choices on others? Number four, presumably the author of the poem lives a somewhat unhappy life and 
is living the best life possible given their geographic situation. Should the narrator feel guilty for keeping the woman employed through his purchases? What, if anything, should he feel guilty for? And question number five. What, if anything, should the narrator have done differently in this story and why? If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, episode 48, and listen to our discussion of this and other short stories from our magazine. We'll include a link in the description. And, of course, you can always continue the discussions on our webpage in the comments section or on our Facebook page. Have a great day. Our story next week will be Take'em. Bye.